Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have an outstanding webinar on tap today with some really great information, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, just know you'll be able to listen to it on demand later on. We will be sending out an email later today that includes a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation you have a question for either of our panelists, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we'll take a few minutes near the end of the presentation and go through the audience questions. And finally, we are uh, proud to announce that we are going to be doing a drawing near the end of today's presentation for five Amazon gift cards worth $50 each. So stay tuned, stay on today's webinar, and uh, we'll be announcing the winners near the end of the webinar. Okay, with that, we will go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is getting your DevOps-enabled product teams to see the forest from the trees. Our Speakers today are Jeff Kyes, who is Director of Product Marketing at Plutora, and Simon King, who is Chief Technical Evangelist at Plutora. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. Good morning, or good, good afternoon, morning. wherever anybody is. Exactly. Uh, Jeff, I know you're going to be kicking us off, so I'm going to put myself on mute, let you do your thing. You bet. I, I love this topic, by the way, because this is the space that we as Platora find ourselves in. We're not the only ones, but if you're not talking about value stream management yet, I hope you start looking into it because it's a really big deal. Uh, the goal of this isn't to tell you about Platora per se, but to tell you about really the fact of, um, you know, there's a lot to be done here of integrating tool chains and so forth. Platora, we're one of the leaders in the space. Uh, go get on our website the the Forester Wave, the new wave that was released. We've got a number of awards and so forth uh, in this space. If you don't know enough about value stream management, that's a great place to start. Today's topic though, really, I'm gonna guess that everybody's here for some critical reasons, and they're gonna fall into one of three buckets. One, you're seeing uh, a shift in architectures and, and looking to get rid of the legacy applications that you've got in terms of their architecture and how they're built. You want to shorten your release cycles. You want to move more towards uh, cloud. You want to move more towards uh, more automated uh, ways of doing things. Uh, you might have some uh, significant culture issues to deal with in terms of smaller autonomous teams, how to navigate compliance. What do you do with legacy dependencies when you're doing that? Or you might be here because simply you're you're seeing massive threat of competitive uh, pressure. You know, it, it threat of disruption, threat of what's going to happen as as people you know create new solutions in your space. As we know, every company is a software company. Uh, if you haven't figured that out, that's your competitive differentiator. Every transaction is powered by software, and your ability to deliver that is the differentiator. Moving faster is why we're all here and making improvements in this. What's challenging in this is in the enterprise, this is hard. We, you know, enterprise companies would, would try to compare themselves to cloud native companies, but there's a lot of differences between cloud native and enterprises. I mean, cloud native companies don't have to deal with the legacy of, of you know, M&A and, and different kinds of architectures, don't have to deal with the fact that on some projects and areas and, and products that exist in the IT ecosystem, there's, you know, some of those people may not even, um, I, I think one of the reports I heard read was talking about how they're not just retiring, they're, they're no longer with us on the planet. It, things are changing and how do you bring that forward? How do you adopt that to, to you know, decouple these systems to, uh, bring these systems in so they're on current modern architecture so that you can homogenize how they integrate with everything. And uh, that's the challenge of why we're here because ultimately to move fast, we've got to solve some of these problems with uh, updating our architectures and, and moving more towards DevOps. As the industry has felt this pressure, the funny thing is, is what do we do? Oh, we better go buy a tool. Well, in fact, since DevOps is the popular word, let's go make sure we get DevOps tool. And thus you see, a massive investment in tooling. It's funny because 
you know, that's only one part of the process, one part of the problem of the people, process, and tools. Of course, you're going to need tools, but at the end of the day, that's that's not really solving it. And and thus we see is people move forward in this tool space and automate as much as possible. Um, you know, they're they're looking well. The gosh, there must be more to this than just uh, automating this. Well, in fact. Uh, I love this from Forrester and talking about how there's a cultural shift that you need to do as you break these projects and so forth down into smaller bits. You need to organize your teams for agile and DevOps and make these product oriented teams self contained, autonomous, self directing. Make them be the pulsing heart of your organization. Now, you can't do that when you have all these other legacy dependencies of, well, what do I do about my change advisory board? How do I handle security? Gosh, I've got to figure out my UX experience. Well, you know what? All those things have to be incorporated into cross-functional or integrated product teams and have these guys run different sets of operations where you get as much automated as possible. I know you've heard this. I'm preaching to the choir. And all this is the, the path that stands as the background and the basis for what we're going to talk about today. Because as you move in this direction, and as you move with self-directed teams, each team creates, in essence, a tree in the forest, and they're moving fast, and they're doing better. The problem is, is now you run into another problem. This is really shown, I love this report by Dora, where they talk about teams that are moving forward into uh, doing a lot of automation, implementing other tools, they get ARA in place, their, their pipelines are automated, they're, you know, the, they're doing far better on CICD, they're shifting their test left, and they hit that second phase where, you know, hey, the automation takes these low performers to, to fantastic progress, and then they hit a wall. And the wall is, well, that's great, but now I have all this technical debt, I have these dependencies, how do I coordinate this? I need to see what's going on. How do I coordinate across teams? I need to implement a policy that spans every single team. How the crap am I gonna do that? As was said from a prospect that I talked to, it was really kind of a, an eye-opening thing. He said, and I quote, we've been doing DevOps for 18 months and we have yet to release anything. They hit the wall and they hit it hard. And now what made it worse is they have so much stuff that they've done. They've introduced new methodologies, new culture that they're having to think through at the same time as delivering products. At the same time, they've got all this legacy stuff to deal with. Now they're in a worse off spot. And the point is, you got to do some, uh, uh, some intelligent thinking. It's not that the automation was bad, but you got to do some intelligent thinking. You've got to do some planning around how you're going to react to this. Where this is most Interesting shows up where individual teams are doing their own thing becomes really the customer experience. Development then focuses on doing things that are good for the business, but not really doing good things for the customer. Well, at the end of the day, we're trying to please the customer. We're trying to deliver value that they will see as important. This is a real life example, and I can imagine the scenario going, I'm going to pick on our U.S. government because why not? I'm sure this is a, a, on the left hand side, you can't see the screen, but um, I'm sure the scenario was that somebody uh, on the Social Security Administration side said, you know what, we've got to get forms out to our customers, you know, people needing benefits and we've got to get feedback from them. We've got to get data from them. And we have all these printed forms. Let, let, we need a way to get these forms to them. And so someone thought to themselves, well, gosh, why don't I take these forms and put them online? That way they can do that. Think of that user experience in today's web connected world. I take, I go to the website, download a form, I gotta print it, and what? I put it in the mailbox? How crazy is that? If anybody would look at what the customer or the consumer view on paper forms, there's only roughly a quarter of the percentage of the people actually think that's a good idea. 75% think that's nuts. And yet this is, this is a standard, it's still a, a current business practice. Here, they're already connected to the web. Why can't they you know, do something better? This is not that hard of a problem to solve. So it's kind of funny as, as you can imagine how that would come down though. Hey, make sure we get data from them. Well, there we go. The problem is alignment, that the business strategy is not aligned to IT strategy. And where this is so evident is that you get, you know, think of a car and the different features that you could have of a car. Hey, does it have two wheels? 
Does it have four wheels? <laughs> what do the wheels look like? Are they big? Are they small? How do you make sure that you get all these different kinds of things aligned with what's really intended? What kind of car? Do you need a pickup? Do you need, you have to be thinking about what that overall strategy is. And without getting the bigger view of what's actually going on, you're not going to have the predictability. You, you still run the risk of being disrupted. You run the risk of having um, other urgent issues jump in the way of your current deliverables. And all these things, as you lead to disruption, interrupt your plans, reduce code quality, create fire drills, and it's a problem. So the point is, is how do you then align what is going on from the business strategy that's going into each of the individual teams? And that's where I'm gonna turn the time over to Simon to give us a bit of a walkthrough of, uh, of uh, what's going on here. And if you give me just a second, let me uh, do a quick switch of presenters here. So Simon, give us a walkthrough of what's, what's happening and, 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 and how do we solve these problems? That's great, thanks Jeff. So we've been used to working on our, our projects in a, in a waterfall fashion and some of you out there I know have been doing a lot of work to, to implement agile tools, agile methodologies, but it still creates additional difficulties because now suddenly where the communication that was happening on a fairly measured cadence suddenly now has to happen a lot faster. So the velocity with which you now execute really starts to make that more difficult. For a start, you're trying to handle straight through flow. You'd like to have the work go straight through the system in agile sprints, quickly, easily, no hiccups. Second of all, you've got small chunks of work. So there's a lot of interaction between the teams to communicate what's done, what needs testing, what the status is, and particularly as you start to coordinate these small chunks of work into larger microservices and then built up to applications, there's still coordination that needs to happen there. And then of course, as you complete the work, not only do you have to finish off the, the hardening and make sure that the transition through DevOps is executed correctly, that the UAT work with the customer is completed, everybody knows what's going on before that change happens, which again, is happening every two weeks, every four weeks now, not every nine months. And straight away, you're moving into the next piece of work. You know, suddenly now you're organizing around what the next piece of incoming work is and moving on, forgetting what's happened in the past. And all the other teams have to still continue to, to execute. So that really creates a lot of difficulty around communication that perhaps wasn't well set up previously. So what I'm going to do for, for the next few minutes is show a couple of demos where we address these issues in terms of how we communicate. So I, I want to first of all show um, looking at those different phases, I'm going to open up that first phase around the backlog and we're going to look at a particular feature and then we're going to look at some of the stories in there. We'll maybe add a new story into there. And of course, as an agile team, you've probably used a number of different uh, products in these different areas. The most common product that we encounter for the backlog and for the user stories is Jira. So I'm going to use Jira uh, in our demo. And what we're going to do is coordinate that information in the demo to help drive alignment and timing of the work that's flowing through the pipeline. So with that, I'm going to switch across to my product demo. So this is, this is the Plutora application. We're looking here at a main dashboard that's kind of showing what's going on in the organization. You can see there's a number of releases going on here. Uh, let's take a look at this, this minor release. You can see it's got kind of traditional phases and gates associated with it, but that's, that's the old style. That's the, the old school way of working. We're going to do something different. Instead, we're going to look at this uh, pipeline release. So it's an external service pipeline. Uh, and that release operates on a different cadence. So if we take a look at the pipeline view, then we'll be able to see uh, pulling from the back end uh, application, we're pulling up a view of uh, the feature that's running. So let me zoom in a little bit for you. So you can see there's this uh, user, user feature 
link server settings of the user management module, and it's got a number of user stories. And there are a couple of them here. And then some of those user stories actually have pull requests linked to them. So we'll go through those sequentially, but we'll start off with uh, looking at the features in the user stories. So if I drill down in, let, let me take a look in here at what's going on. So in, in the user stories, uh, if, I, if I look now, I can filter down in and look at the features. And I can take a look and see, uh, I think it was number 825, this link server settings. So this is a ticket. Uh, it's got a type of feature. And you can see down here, again, if I zoom in, there's a number of linked user stories. So these user stories are linked directly. They're children of this uh, parent. And that's how we're tracking the relationships between them. So if we want to uh, look at where those came from, we can move across to Jira. And we can see here we've got a regular Jira board set up. And the Jira board has a number of different tickets in here. And we can go ahead and add a new one. So let, let's go ahead and create one. Uh, this can be, uh, let's see, add support for voice authentication. So we've got a new biometric uh, capability. And when I create that, it's going to get a number. So let, let's remember that number, C1-16. So C1-16 is a new ticket. And that ticket is going to flow across to our system. So let's go and take a look. And we'll switch here now from our features to our user stories. And when we take a look here, we now see this 889 ticket, add support for voice authentication, has shown up. And if we uh, drill down into it, then we can see that this ticket has kind of flowed across. And I added in previously a JIRA ID. This is a piece of additional information. It's a, a JIRA ID C1-16. So that got picked up from the ticket and dropped down uh, into the view here. So if we take a look at how some of this magic is happening, let's go across into settings and take a look and see how that information is flowing over. So what we did, we set up an integration. Uh, we set it up on changes. And it's tied to this project C1 in Jira. And there's a set of field mappings in here. And the kind of key ones that it's pulling across, it's pulling across the live status from the ticket. It's pulling across the description. And it's pulling across the Jira key and dropping it into this Jira ID uh, field in, in our backend system. So that's how the data is flowing across. And we can take a look. It's updating every 15 seconds. So if I say I'm now actually going to go start working on that ticket, if I drag and drop it to in progress and talk to you for a couple of seconds while the magic happens on the back end, then presumably at some point here when I come back to the, to the view, look at the user stories, I should now, in fact, you can see it there in the status. The status is updated already to in progress. So that's great. Now, now I'm able, as a developer, to keep track of the tickets. And uh, when I'm looking in the main dashboard, I'll actually see that that ticket now is associated uh, in the pipeline view. So it's almost like the management side, if I'm a product owner, I can not only see what's happening in the dev tooling for my team, but I can come here and see an overview of what's happening. So it's just taking a few seconds. Um, so, so while that's happening, let's, let's figure out uh, what we're going to work on. So we're going to work on this user story. And we're going to go ahead and update a file in, in GitHub. So uh, in GitHub, we have a repository. There's a project here that, that's tied in. And that repository has a number of different files in it. Uh, maybe we'll create a new file. Uh, let's see. Uh, enable voice 
authentication. Listen to voice, listen for keyword, and uh, authenticate with biometrics. Okay, so we're creating a new file. Let's name it voice auth. And we'll go ahead. Now, in this case, we're going to create a new branch. So we're using a branching strategy. So for our new features, uh, we're creating a branch, and I'll create a pull request on that branch. So start a new pull request. So here we're going to start the pull request. And uh, what I need to do is link it back to that ticket. Now, if I just check the ticket I'm working on, C1-16. So I'm going to type C1-16 here uh, in the title, and now it should just uh, propagate that ticket through for me. So I'll go ahead and create the pull request. So uh, first draft of flow for voice auth. So we create a pull request. So the, the system CI hasn't been set up. It's just created this uh, pull request. I've asked someone to look at that. So that's great. Uh, now, what's happening in the back end? So let's Let's refresh the dashboard. Go take a look at our pipeline. So refresh that. Seems it's taking a second to load, so we'll just look directly in our user stories. So let's take a look. So we, we added support for voice authentication. And this ticket is there, that's good. So now uh, let's take a look at the integration that we have running for GitHub. So the GitHub integration is implemented a little differently. And that is implemented using our integration hub. And what we've done here is create a script that runs in the background that is going to pull across the ticket from GitHub and create uh, a pull request for it. So there's a job that's running here. Uh, it's there's some, some server-side JavaScript that's running. It's running every five minutes. I can get it to, to run just on demand. So let's get it to execute now. So it's reaching across to our GitHub instance, and uh, it's going to pull up that ticket. So let's take a look and see. It should have run. Yep, it's run. It's run successfully, and it's you know tracked the the connection to GitHub and pulled data across. That's great. So, okay. So basically, I could have. I just have a couple of questions, Simon, because frankly, if I have all of my Epic in one, you know. Jira instance and one team's working on it. Um, why, why do I even need to do this? Because can I just go to that one Jira instance and work on it, Simon? You could, but the issue is for some integrations, it's just a simple uh, field mapping. So you just want to map the field to the field, and then you've got a replica of the ticket. And you saw that exact example with Jira where we mapped across fields that were already in Jira. We took one of the the kind of hidden fields, if you will, the JIRA ID, and we just drop that into an additional info field. But in the case here with GitHub, we've got a little more going on. So what we're doing is we're pulling the ticket across, but then we're actually looking at the comment. If you remember, I put C1-16 in the start of the comment here, mm -hmm. and then we're going to go find that ticket in the back end and link this u the pull request to the user story. So there's a little more business logic there. And for that, we use the server-side JavaScript. Gotcha. Well, I, no, so here's the real problem then. So really, when an epic comes out or I have an initiative, it's going to get spanned across a whole bunch of teams. How are you going to solve that? Because that's not in one Jira. It's the fact it may not, you know, some may be using Jira, some may be using something else. So uh, how would I use this to solve that problem? Great question. So a couple of different use cases there, sticking just with Jira alone. 
you know, we see some customers use the project fix version as a way to denote the, the linkage of the user stories. So in that case, we would create an integration that would look at the project fix version. If it doesn't exist in Plutora, it would create it as a release. And then having created it as a release, it would then link the user stories to that, to that fix version, to that, to that release. So you're saying this is going to span across multiple instances of Jira? Span across multiple instances of Jira. If one team's using Jira and for whatever reason, another team is using a different issue management system, that's no problem. You can handle multiple instances. We are standardizing and normalizing all that data in one place. So no problem. Gotcha. And are, does that mean that, is this a live view or is this actually synchronizing and copying the data into a common data model? So it's the latter. It's synchronizing the data into a common data model. You could see that it's doing it on a pretty quick basis. Every you know 15 seconds, I think we had the uh, Jira adapter set up for, and that means you've got a pretty up-to-date view. But it's it's harmonized. So if you're looking at multiple pipelines, and particularly if multiple pipelines are being brought together at some integration point for then staging and integration testing in UAT, now you've got the gates and controls to be able to do that. What if, uh, how does this relate to, you know, PPM systems? Uh, you know, if, if I have a whole uh, initiative that's being kicked off with my PPM group, is there a way to correlate and draw that back? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's part of the rationale that we drew up here around kind of backlog and storage. We, we definitely see some customers use tools like Salesforce IdeaStorm for, for tracking the ideas with, the, with their end customers, with their business partners and then flowing those across into JIRA uh, at the point at which they're kind of accept, accepting them and turning them mm -hmm. into real features. Right. So one of the questions that we get asked fairly regularly is, you know, when do you start the clock on the timer from, you know, change request accepted to, to delivery into production? We can't, quite often will separate that ideation process and, and you know, high-level backlog uh, management from the, okay, now we've accepted this ticket and we're going to start working on it. Awesome. So, okay, so um, if we go ahead and, and look now, if we uh, take a look in uh, the system here, we'll look at the pipeline view. So what we wanted to follow up on here was that um, the, the view is going to pick up correctly. And we'll see here, if we zoom in, then we've got uh, add support for voice authentication. I'm noticing that our pull request is not propagated across. So let me take a look and make sure everything happened fine there. It's always the fun with these live demos, making sure we uh, follow <laughs> the script. Well, and this is really cool because what you're showing is the ability to, you know, aggregate across systems. And I, this is a huge problem today. Um, sure, an individual dev team at the dev and test side, and maybe the product owners know what's going on, but really, nobody else does. And you've got to have some way to be able to dig in and see what's going on. What you're describing here is a way to actually pull all this out into a common system where you can actually take a look at it and see what's happening. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll assume that the, that the gremlins are at play here somewhere. I, I think it looks like our pull request did not come across. That's okay. Uh, so we'll see here, this is where pull requests would show up. So we created a filter on here. These pull requests are getting you know, brought over. And if we take a look, we can kind of see some of what's going on in the back end. So you can see here when the integration runs, it's writing in the repository that the data came from, the up updating GitHub so you can track right back to it. Uh, it's writing in the comments, so it's picking up the comments from the JIRA ticket and uh, tying into the JIRA IDs. You, can, you know, to that question earlier, Jeff, around, you know, how, how do I tell if I'm working in a multi-repository environment, multi-project environment? These are things that can, that can help you navigate and understand what's going on. Cool. So the, the second part of the demo here is, is understanding, you know, what's going on. So we can also analyze uh, how work is proceeding through, through all these systems. And so to do that, uh, in the background, I, I previously set up uh, a little sort of demo analytics. So we're going to take a look here at this view. So we can take a look first at uh, you know what's going on in terms of releases by type. So I'm opening up our analytics system. 
This is part of the Plutora platform. All of the data is brought across uh, automatically and synchronized into a data warehouse. And then we're using a Tableau powered front end to enable us to, to build and, and edit these uh, additional uh, an analyses of the, of the data. So you can see here, I'm looking at releases by type. I've got a couple of different types of release. I'm looking at the uh, release names that are tied to that, and I've got, I'm pulling through the dates of, of implementation. Uh, if I back up, I can actually open up a dashboard. So a dashboard contains uh, a number of different uh, features. So it contains a couple of different uh, worksheets that uh, that basically uh, set up uh, a view of releases. So what we showed earlier, the releases by type. And then below it, it's looking at the user stories associated with it. So if we go and look, if we, if we roll back to 2018 Q4, so I can select the date, uh, then I can see there's a couple of different releases here. If I look and see you know, what was going on, then our different release types were, were in process. So it looks like in Q4, we mainly had project releases and you know, pretty significant number of changes associated with them. This is kind of a more classic kind of waterfall view where we were you know, running fairly large uh, batch sizes through the, through the system. And instead, if we look at 2019 Q1, you know, we're going to see you know, more kind of agile releases and much smaller batch sizes here. So uh, a, lot, a lot smaller uh, amount of work being passed through the system, looking for that kind of straight through processing. Hmm. So the a second view that, that I also created around uh, user stories and trending. So the nice thing about pulling data into the data warehouse is that you can analyze data over time. So distinct from a traditional operational report that will just look at a current state, uh, by putting data in the data warehouse, I can then look at trends and see you know, what's happening over time. So I can start to see already there was a transition from Q3 through, Q3 through Q4 where we started to kind of tune the amount of work that we were doing. And then as we got through into Q1, uh, we've really only got a small amount of work in flight. So you're not seeing that large amount of work in progress. The teams are starting to tell me that they're not whipsawing the whole time, uh, you know, changing, um, changing the focus of what they're working on. They're more productive because they're able to do the straight through processing. And you can also see there isn't some huge backlog uh, set up for Q2 pretty common if this were a more traditional water floor, water floor, waterfall uh, organization, they would probably already have three and six months of work already lined up, mm -hmm. staring them in the face. So, right. You know, you can see they're really kind of changing how they're working here. So <coughs> we can take a look at these reports. I think just while I'm glancing at this one, you know, I'll notice that, you know, I can go in and uh, select alerts. So I'm able to actually um, select the distinct count of changes and say that I want an alert on that. So I could say, you know, if this now uh, exceeded a threshold, you know, say for example, the the number of tickets, you know, went over 20, maybe that would be a, mm -hmm. a red flag for me in the organization. I could actually get that sent to me. I could create an alert and have it sent to me or to some other project manager. So now, now I've got, you know, significantly more capabilities to start tracking what's going on. And I can also go in and, and edit and take a look at these dashboards. So I might have these as a standard dashboard that I'm posting on a, on a monitor on the wall in the hallway so that people can see them. But I might also have analysts that are coming in and creating more advanced reports. So we can go back and look at these simpler worksheets um, that, that basically allow me to uh, see how these were constructed. So this is using a data set that's being pulled out of Plutora called Release Changes. There are a number of different data sets in here, so I can pull through from any of the additional information that I'm tracking around. You know, I've got audit data, so I can create compliance reports. Uh, I've got deployment plan data, so I can see deployments to production. I've got environment data, so I can take a look at how different test environments are being used. Obviously, my release data and then also my test data. 
So I think those would probably be you know good areas that we cover maybe in future webinars, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can see here I can just drag and drop from the field, so I was able to to pull across. So for example, I can grab the change identifier and drop that in here. So this is the ID that we were seeing uh, across in our system here. It's just our ID identifier that we use to uh, uniquely name these tickets. So I can drag and drop these these uh, these fields. Another thing I can do is uh, use different visuals. So when I set up the data in particular ways, the system is tracking how that data is organized, and it allows me then to pick from a set of valid views. So I can, for example, you know, change the view, you know, from one to another. Uh, you know, maybe use you know a bubble chart so I can see the outliers. So there are different views that I might select in order to make a particular point. So I can always just change that. And if I change it here, you know, if I go and look across to my dashboard, then it's it's already populated through. So wow. I've got so I've got a good way to to create these different um, these different dashboards. So this is amazing to me. Um, it feels like what I'm getting here is the ability to peek into individual development teams and the product teams and what they're what they're actually doing. Yeah. So you know, I think. This is this is a good way of looking kind of in aggregate of what's going on. But if I'm working in a development team and you know want to know what you know, particularly if I'm a tester, what what are we testing right now? You know, how's that working? So there is another different view that we can create that's more kind of a, of a live view that's showing our again our identity service pipeline. I can pick from the different pipelines, you know, up here. But say I'm just looking at that pipeline, now I can see these different higher level environments that are being used as we bring together the pipelines and start to get them ready for production. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got an SIT area, UAT area, and staging ready for production. And I can see the, the different components of the build. We've got this authorization server, the one that we were talking about earlier. I can drill down into that and I can actually see here are the different uh, versions that have been built. I think we're using uh, Jenkins on the back end to, to execute these builds mm -hmm. and I can see these different build versions and if I look at you know some of these there are commits and they're tied into the Jira tickets also so you know this is a way that you can visualize kind of in real time here's the build here's the version that's on that server and I can access that server and see where it is so if I'm working in QA I know what version is on there I know what commits are in there, so I can see defects that are fixed, or you know, does, does it have that new feature that I'm attempting to test? That's cool. What uh, you know, I can do this, and I, it looks like I don't actually have to talk to the individual teams. I'm getting this by aggregate, just by the nature of the integration. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, you're bringing up a, a good point, Jeff. Which um, a colleague of mine and I were out at a, a bank recently. Um, large bank very focused on on devops they've been doing it for a while and they had a number of different microservices teams uh, one of them actually was focused on uh, authorization services and so we were chatting with them and they kind of introduced us to the team they were physically laid out in you know long table lines with you know the product owner and the developers and they would take it in turns as to who was doing support they deploy their own code they're in full devops Wow, and yet still they have problems of communication, mm. and those problems were that you know no 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 service operates you know on its own. It doesn't operate just as a single service fully independently. They had dependencies on other services, and they had applications that depended on them. Sure, and so for them it was really kind of key to be able to to see you know some of what what's going on in the pipeline, and so. You know, they wanted to take their product owner away from being that single point of failure. They're the go-to person mm. to communicate. And so now I'm just glancing back and I'm, I'm seeing that uh, our integration did run in the back end. So now we can see that, you know, instead of in the past where the business team might say, okay, what are you working on and what stage is it at? Now they can see directly that this link server feature they asked for has a new support voice authentication they asked for, and they can see that work has started. So, you know, it, you're allowing teams to communicate directly 
without having to go into meetings. Meetings can soak up 10, 20, 30 percent of time. So anything we can do to streamline that communication really helps the productivity of the teams. Yeah, well, and I know how much developers love being in meetings and giving status. Um, that that just doesn't happen. What you know, uh, the other side of the analytics looks like I can also uh, homogenize independent of whatever development methodology each individual team is using. I, you know, in the enterprise, while they may not be like that bank you spoke of, um, I, it's, uh, I, I mean, this is a big deal to be able to say, hey, I can normalize across a team that's doing waterfall and a team that's that's doing more agile DevOps. De definitely. I mean, I, I think one of, one of the other things we hear regularly from customers is they're making these investments in automation uh, and they feel like they're working harder, right? Because there's less work in progress and there's sure. less slack time in between the activities. Yep. So they feel like they're working harder. How do they know? How do they show that they're actually producing the results? And, you know, really, I think the analytics is the way that they can do that. Uh, they can start to look at calculations around duration, right? So they can create um, a view that says, you know, how am I doing on the time from when a change ticket was raised to to when it's uh, uh, you know to when it's deployed, so they can go right in and say you know let's take a look. Here's when the ticket was raised, uh, so it was raised on a particular day. So we could go in and and set it up. Uh, here's, here's the date that it was raised. They can do a calculation and say you know this is the duration of the ticket. So we'll Take a look in days at the time from when the ticket was raised to when it was uh, deployed. You know, it's funny. I've been in the development world for a long time, and it and it's funny to me to think that, gosh, I would have loved to have this. You know, when I the amount of the the amount of analysis that I've always wanted to be able to do on the process of development and managing the value stream. This is really cool. Yeah, I mean, I, so, I, I think all the development teams would love to have this visibility as to how long tickets are taking to deploy. So I know that this is a really common, in, you know, a common problem that people are facing out there, trying to understand metrics of delivery, metrics that are out there. I know there's some other cool tools out there, even open source. Uh, one that comes to mind that's really cool for an individual team is, you know, like Hygieia, or even if I'm in Jenkins, like the DevOptic side. Um, how does all this really compare to those kinds of tools. I mean, they're still valuable, but uh, what would I get in addition to that? So, so I think the key is is what you said earlier, which is you know any any of the tools that you deploy. I mean, e even any specific command line tools or or kind of point visibility that you create uh, for your for an individual team, that's great. But having a way to see what's going on across the whole portfolio uh, is really key. And this, you know, by aggregating the data you allow the organization to create some standards so that, for example, the duration of a ticket is calculated uniformly, mm. because obviously it's gonna be de very different if you calculate when the ticket was first raised by the customer team, versus it was when it was first accepted by the product owner. Good point, yep. So, you know, I think that's one of the important things of having uh, a view like this where you can kind of standardize it, and I think going a step further, when you look at, you know, there'll, there'll always be some early adopter teams that are quite happy to adopt new technologies, new ways of working. You know, they don't fear change, they don't fear the risk of failure, and they kind of push the envelope around what they can do. And then there are other teams always that are kind of laggards, right? Sometimes with good reason, right? They're working on um, mission critical systems, they're working on systems that are tied into slow moving um, business processes. So if I think about the, an SAP team, they may still be working on, the, on at least a three-month schedule to tie in with the quarterly reporting, yep. but maybe even an annual schedule so that year to year they've got kind of consistent data. So they might be making some internal changes, mm -hmm. um, you know, data changes, et cetera, but the business rules around taxes and stuff like that have to move on a fairly steady cadence. And the system has to be really reliable, cannot go down, particularly that last week of the quarter, you're going to have things like blackout periods. Sure. So when you look at um, you know a, re a release calendar, if you're looking at what's going on, you're going to see different releases of different kinds, and you're going to see them, you know, laid out with different cadences. So you'll be able to see 
you know, here's the different releases that are occurring in a given window if you're in the ops team. But if you then look at the schedule over time, then you're able to look and see here's when certain things are happening and you might want to include the block out period. So whether it's, you know, Thanksgiving for a retail organization or whether it's quarter end for, for a different organization, you can see the layout of all the releases and you can see when things occur, are occurring, when stuff needs to be synchronized. And I think that's, that's an important reason to start to pull all the data together so that between teams and between cadences, uh, you can get that visibility. But you can then also show those metrics to the laggard team right. and say, hey, speed up, guys. <laughs> you know, we, there's a business value here. We, we, we talk with mainframe teams now who are doing DevOps. Yep. Uh, th there's nothing about the technology these days, the underlying technology, that says you can't move faster. If mainframe teams can be doing DevOps, then for sure many other teams can. But I, th I still think that doesn't change from the cadence or when you, you know, there's a natural cadence to when you can deploy stuff. So I can deploy updates to business analytics fairly regularly because it doesn't affect how the business operates. It just improves visibility for product managers and sales leaders. Mm -hmm. But conversely, the tax logic, the pricing and packaging of products, the SKUs in the SAP system, they may be updating no more than every 90 to 180 days so the sales team can be properly informed. Gotcha. Well, one more question and then and from my end, you know, in these processes, you know, one of the groups that tends to shut down these highly iterative approaches are, you know, the dreaded security boards, the change advisory boards, because they want to make sure that governance is being enforced. And I don't really care what, you know, as to put my wording on it, you know, I don't care what, you know, newfangled new methodology you got or what level of automation, but you better, you know, pound on the table, uh, prove that I, I can audit your um, you know, your, your gov you know, the things that I'm telling you, you got to do, you got to get your threat modeling in there. You got to get, I, I, how do I make sure all that happens with this? Because I have all these new methodologies and stuff. And, and in order to see the whole force, I've got to make sure that that's enforced for every single pipeline. So what, what are you doing to help me there? Th that's right. I mean, I, I think we, we see that a lot. We, we tend to work with large enterprises, um, just by virtue of, the the solution that we have we've seen a lot of financial organizations and um, organizations that work in healthcare and telcos and they've all got some kind of sarbox or pci or hipaa or fda regulation and so you know we talked earlier about the kind of phases and gates mm -hmm. but if we drill down into those and take a look at like what's going on the phases and gates are tied in with um, with activities and those activities allow us to, to kind of see um, how we're tracking on things that we said, this is what we need to be doing. So I think I've got a template here. Customers often create um, a release template. And, you know, that release template might well have a number of different activities, you know, coded into it. So if we take a look, um, yeah, this one does. So the, this one's set up kind of as a little more of a, a sprint model. So we've got a hardening phase and regression phase. If we dr drill down into these, you see there are very specific activities that, that are happening here. And I, and I think, you know, what you were alluding to is that for these uh, agile teams, for these DevOps teams that are using a high degree of automation on the back end, A, that doesn't preclude them from having to follow these guidelines, but they may obviously not want to have to have meetings and, and, sure. and so on. So we have a whole set of APIs that allow customers to integrate in. So this performance testing in this case that might be being run through Selenium or some other load testing tool can update the data directly. So there is a whole set of APIs that um, are available that allow uh, DevOps teams to tie the tool chain directly into the back end. So these are the same APIs that, that we were using to tie in the pull requests. Um, you know, so those, those APIs can be used to pick up defects. If they've got test automation going on, it's automatically logging sure. defects. Um, if they're, you know, tracking the, the phases, then you've got the ability to tie in all the phases to the release. And you can see, you know, here's all the release details. So you can actually access directly the, the ability to, um, to see different releases, different bookings, different systems or applications that are being changed. Uh, who all the stakeholders are, so who gets notified yep. when scope change happens. So 
So there's a, a lot of automation that you can do. We basically are a, a, a catwalk over the top of all the DevOps tools in the tool chain. And we have APIs that let you either write data to us or pull data from us in order to go execute. Cool. So kind of summing up in two minutes or less, look, there's some core problems of, of functional delivery, of, of running these features through your pipelines, regardless of whatever methodology you're using, but made worse as you get more self-directed autonomous teams. And those are ensuring the functional alignment that when you say, hey, we need to get data from our customers, you're not shipping them a PDF and having them fill it out and mail it back. Ensuring scheduling alignment to make sure that features, whether you release darkly or switched or, uh, it, or you actually have a coordinated release, does it really matter at the end of the day? Those things have to be live for the customers when they're needed to be live. How do you make sure that happens? Ensuring integration, making sure that they actually work together, making sure that um, uh, you know, the database actually gets aligned for when things need to be there. And then ultimately, making sure that you get your compliance, security, and quality to the right levels. We have to make trustworthy computing be part of our nomenclature and things that we talk about all the time. Um, you know, that's really where we come in as Platora. We are managing the value stream, and we integrate data across the entirety of the tool chain. I know we focused only today on the planning and the you know, code build test kind of tooling, but we incorporate tooling and data and artifacts from across the entire pipeline. You know, the goal here is ultimately to improve the speed and quality of this complex application delivery, the world in which we live. And we do that by giving complete visibility of the entire pipeline and not only visibility, but analytics for crying out loud. Go slice and dice, do historical, compete your teams, prove that you're actually doing better. It's amazing to me in this DevOps, in this digital transformation, in the billions of dollars spent on tooling, that most organizations can't answer the most fundamental question. Are we doing better than we were before? Well, that's what this is all about, doing better. So with that, um, well, uh, you know, come to our website. We've got some, some case studies you can look at. Uh, there's some great quotes that I could give you about people in their, in their journey. No one is all the way there. If you feel like you're just starting on your journey, you're in the process, you are not alone. Come talk to us. We'll help you in this journey. We'll help prove all the way through the organization what works and how well you're doing. We have lots of case studies about enterprise after enterprise, financial organization, banks, pharma, Massive amounts of regulatory compliance, massive amounts of process, culture that all has to shift. We can help you in this process. Come talk to us. With that, we'll stop here for some questions. Okay, great. Um, we have about seven minutes to the top of the hour, so I think we have time for one or two questions. Um, so we'll jump right in. First one, how does uh, change management uh, integrate then with ServiceNow, as I, I saw this in the list of supported third-party third tools. Great question. Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of different ways. I mean, in the earlier days when customers were mostly focused on environment management, we would tie our change requests for environments across to the operational change that ServiceNow has. But we're also seeing customers sync up the releases and the features associated with the releases with ServiceNow for, for those organizations that are playing around with that part of the tool. But we're pretty flexible. We can tie into their CMDB for environment data, to the operational change, and to the release area. OK, great. Next question, can we export this deployment summary as a source file? So I, I'm, I'm wondering what they mean by deployment summary. I mean, I think in each of the areas within the tool. So we, we found that we've had this request pretty much around any of the data we see, whether it's calendar, maybe that's what they were alluding to, the calendar and the, and the schedule, or even within the analytics, within the dashboards. Any of that data is exportable, either as raw data to Excel, for example, or as a finished image, like a, a PDF or a, a, a JPEG that they can distribute uh, from within the system, either with notifications or just manually send it out. 
You know, and I'd, I'd expand on that is, it, frankly, it, we have a whole freaking analytics system. Why, why export the data? Uh, just integrate it in, um, create your own. Uh, analytics is different than a report, right? I mean, it's interactive, it's, it's go play. Um, a lot of the stuff that you'll find, because the minute you'll send out some kind of report, well, it's gonna raise a question and, and you kind of need to be able to follow your nose to whatever problem to get to root cause. Hey, our, 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 Simon, you brought up the, the whip. We're, we're, our whip is increasing. Why, what's going on there? You know what? You kind of have to drill down a couple of other levels and go, oh, I can compare this to that. And now I see exactly what's going on. And that's the view I need. So the power of analytics gives you the ability to not just, you know, uh, go through this and, and, and see a view at a point in time, but um, you send out more live interactive versions of this data because it's a ton of data. All right, great, great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, let's see, what is your experience in regulated industries such as uh, pharma uh, or within GXP environments? So, so we definitely find that um, organizations that the, the more regulations they have, the more you know compliance issues and audit issues they have to deal with. The more valuable this system is because. You know, I, I've worked in other organizations where we've had multiple point tools, and whenever we have uh, audits from, from pharmaceutical companies, you know, they'll come on site for a couple of days with their auditors, and they have to go through all the artifacts, then they'll select a number of them, you know, randomly, and then go interview the users. The beauty of this tool is that it codifies the, the workflow, so there's no, there's very little kind of um, variation in terms of how work is executed. And then it's all documented and related to each other. So it's very easy for an auditor to see that the process was followed and to see what the connection between documents is to know who to go talk to correctly. So it really does streamline that. And, and we even found we got audited uh, for a financial prospect a, a week or two ago. And, you know, they thought originally that it was going to take two days. They scheduled two days with two auditors and the, a member of the, the prospect team. And they ended up saying, you know what, we can with the documentation you provided, which obviously is based on our system, we can get this done in one day. So it really does simplify that work and make sure that you have the, the data you need for those kind of regulated industries. And on top of it, you know, you can actually ensure the governance so that you don't care about audit. And frankly, the whole point of this is to keep the dev and test focused on deving and testing um, and, and product folks to keep focusing on designing features and all this other lack of a better word, sorry if I offend anybody, crap gets in the way of delivering the value to customers. Granted, it has to be done for trustworthy computing, um, and it has to be done so that we deliver high quality software. Um, if you're struggling in any of these areas, man, please get a hold of us. Um, it doesn't matter where you are in your DevOps journey, we can help you. We can help you do better, we can prove it. All right. Great, so we are about two minutes to the top of the hour, so I'm afraid that's all the time that we do have for questions. I know we got a lot of them in, and um, I apologize if we didn't get to your question, but please know that the folks at Plotora are getting a copy of all of the questions, and so I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you uh, to get your question answered uh, offline. So um, with that, before we close things out, I do want to um, do the drawing for the five $50 Amazon gift cards. So drum roll, please, Jeff. Okay, first one, first gift card winner is Carol Reinhardt. Congratulations, Carol. Uh, next gift card winner, uh, Kenneth Leong. I, I, if I mispronounce your name, I apologize, but Kenneth, you are our second winner. Third winner, Michael Hoffman. Congratulations, Michael. Uh, fourth winner is uh, Vishnu Vinakota. Again, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but congratulations, Vishnu. And our final winner is uh, Scott Marshall. So congratulations, Scott. Congratulations to everybody who did win. Um, and uh, you have the chance to win uh, in future webinars. So, uh, you know, take a look at the, the webinars that we have coming up. Um, just a reminder also that today's webinar has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, or if you just want to listen to it again, uh, you will have the opportunity to do so. We are going to be sending out an email a little bit later on today that includes a link to 
access the webinar on demand. And um, the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. So please feel free to check it out there. Just go to the webinar section on the website, click under On Demand, and it should be right there waiting for you. And then while you're there, go ahead and take a look at all the other webinars that we have, both upcoming and on demand. Hopefully there will be some that pique your interest. Uh, but uh, Jeff and Simon, thank you both for your time today. Great presentation. I know, judging from the uh, number of questions we got, that the audience got a lot out of it. So thanks so much for your time, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. All right. All right. Thank you also to the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.